Hello and welcome to the channel. So today I have here my uh, Kubota BX1870 subcompact tractor. It has uh, just over 200 hours on the clock now. So today I'm going to be performing the uh, 200 hour maintenance. Now what I have here is the uh, service interval printout from the user's manual. I also have a couple of uh, backup pages I printed from the service manual to help me out here. And I will be going basically through this uh, step by step, although I won't be following exactly the same order that's uh, printed here in the manual. Now uh, this is a, a BX1870, but if you have any other Kubota in the uh, BX series, the maintenance is going to be virtually identical. And also, uh, before I get started on the uh, maintenance schedule, what I want to do is I want to go ahead and check the uh, fluid levels. That gives me a uh, baseline, lets me know if I have any problems like any uh, burning oil or any leaks or anything like that. So checking the engine oil on this tractor is basically just like any other uh, engine. It's uh, pretty straightforward, but uh, this is a diesel engine. As you can see here, the uh, oil is pretty darn dark. That's actually uh, pretty typical for a diesel. And it's just uh, very slightly below the full mark, which is uh, probably about where it was when I changed the oil last. So I think we're good there. Now around the back here is the uh, dipstick to check the fluid level in the transmission. Now according to Kubota, the engine should not be running when you check the fluid level here. I'm just going to pull it out, wipe it off. I'm going to put it all the way back in and then out one more time. Now it looks like the uh, level is right around the halfway mark, maybe just slightly less than halfway. Now check the fluid level in the uh, front axle housing. There's this little plug and dipstick here. Now mine is really tight. I can't pull this off by hand. So I'm using this little pry tool just to get it up far enough. And then I'm going to get these uh, needle nose pliers. These have a 90 degree bend. And uh, that will fit on either side there. Hopefully I can pry it up without breaking it. Yeah, that wasn't very hard. So fluid level looks good on this one. It is uh, right below the full mark. So I think we're good there. Put that back in. And okay, so I'm back around the uh, front of the tractor now. It's going to be a little hard to see, but uh, just in here under the hood is the uh, coolant level. And uh, I don't know if you can tell there, but it's uh, right around the halfway mark between uh, low and high. So again, I think uh, we're all good with all the fluid levels and I don't have any leaks to worry about. Okay, so next up I'm going to be checking out the OPC or Operator Presence Control. So I have the uh, tractor in neutral and I have the brake on. So the idea here is I'll start up the engine, press the uh, speed control pedal here, and then stand up. And that should uh, enable the uh, safety feature and shut off the engine. So uh, let's we'll see if it works. So similar to the last test, uh, this test will be checking the safety feature when I engage the uh, PTO clutch here. So again, I'm gonna start the engine and uh, engage the PTO clutch and then stand up and uh, that should shut off the engine within one second. Okay, so OPC system has been tested and seems to be working. Okay, so next I'll be adding fresh grease to all the uh, grease fittings. Now, according to the manual, there's only one grease fitting on the tractor itself. That's just below this little flap here. This actually goes to the uh, speed control pedal. Now, I've gone ahead and with the uh, paper towel and a screwdriver and got all the muck and junk out of here to uh, make it um, clean before I add grease to that fitting there. And uh, it just requires general purpose grease, which is what I have in this little canister. And this is just a standard grease gun with the exception of this uh, fitting here. This is made by a uh, lock and load and I really like these. Uh, they're not that expensive and it makes jobs like this go a lot easier because it makes it much easier to attach and detach the grease gun, especially when the uh, grease fitting is down in a recess like this. So you just pull this little handle back here and it fits right on there. And when you're done, pull the handle back and it comes right off. Okay, so next I'll be addressing the uh, grease fittings on the uh, front end loader here. And basically every time you see a joint like this, you're gonna have an associated grease fitting along with it. So there's gonna be one here, one here, 
one here and then one down here at the uh, bucket. Now I've gone ahead and cleaned up all the uh, grease fittings with the paper towel. And of course on the other side, you're gonna have exactly the same uh, grease fittings as well. And there'll be a couple on the uh, front of the uh, front end loader as well. And I'll uh, get to those next. Okay, so here on the uh, front side of the front end loader, I have a uh, grease fitting right on the uh, top here, and the one down here on the bucket on the side. Now, um, my tractor has this uh, quick attach bracket as well. You may or may not have that, but if you do, you're gonna have one more grease fitting, and that's gonna be uh, right here. Of course, the grease fittings on this side of the loader will be in the uh, same locations as they were on the other side. Okay, so I've uh, removed the uh, front panel here and I've taken out the battery. That's because in the user's manual under the lubrication section, it says I should add a bit of grease to the uh, battery posts and terminals. I think that's a good idea because that'll help to prevent any uh, corrosion on the battery. Now, uh, before I add the grease, I'm going to go ahead and do something else, though, because the user's manual also suggests that I measure the uh, battery voltage to give me an idea of the uh, state of charge of the battery and to see how long it may last. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Okay, so we have uh, roughly 12 and a half volts. I have this little lookup table from the manual, so 12 and a half is halfway between 12.4 and 12.6, so it's halfway between 75 and 100% fully charged. I'm going to uh, leave it alone and uh, hopefully it'll last me a bit longer. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, clean up the battery. I have just some uh, standard rubbing alcohol here and a little brush. And for the grease, I'm actually going to be using this. This is uh, silicone grease. It's a dielectric grease. It's also called bulb grease, but it's uh, good for electronic components. <laughs> Okay, so now that the uh, front end loader has been lubricated, I'm going to go ahead and take it off. I'll just uh, get it out of the way and help provide a little bit easier access to everything. Now that the front end loader is removed, you can see I'm uh, getting a bit of uh, rust build up here on this little cradle where the uh, front end loader sits and uh, also up here on this little uh, joint here. So I'm just gonna take some uh, grease with my finger and go ahead and lube these up on both sides of the tractor. Okay, so uh, just to make access easier, I've gone ahead and removed the outer engine shroud. Uh, it's pretty easy to remove. You just uh, unscrew these little, uh, little screw tabs here and it just pulls forward right off. Now, uh, next I'm gonna be changing out the uh, air filter. And uh, it's a really straightforward process. There's these little uh, tabs here, one on the top and one on the uh, bottom. And then this should just pull right off. Now, uh, normally you'd have a, an air filter that looks something like this, just a paper element. And this is replaceable. You can actually uh, wash these, but uh, only a couple of times. But uh, I've replaced the uh, paper filter with uh, one of these K&N style filters here. And uh, that means that uh, it's a permanent filter and I'll need to uh, clean it and uh, spray it with some oil. Now, um, the couple things you want to check on the air filter is uh, this little valve down here. You want to make sure that it, it's not plugged up. It can accumulate uh, dirt and that sort of thing. And uh, you want to go ahead and clean the inside of this little cap and then check the uh, air hose here uh, for any uh, cracks or leaks as well. Okay, so the air filter housing and the cap has been uh, cleaned and my uh, air filter has been cleaned and oiled, so now I'm just putting it back into place. OK, 
Okay, so it's time to drain the engine oil. I had the uh, engine running for the last few minutes, so it's nice and warm now. I've uh, shut it off, and it's time to uh, take out the uh, oil drain bolt. That is uh, right over here on the left side of the engine, and it's a 14 millimeter bolt. Now the oil filter is right here on the uh, right side of the engine. Okay, so I've got a new uh, oil filter here. I've gone ahead and put some oil inside the filter and put a bead of oil around the uh, seal. So this is a uh, Sten oil filter. I bought a whole case of them a uh, long time back. The part number on this one is 120-137. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and put it on now. Okay, so it's time to add engine oil. So the uh, oil capacity for this tractor is about 3.1 quarts. So uh, I'll go ahead and add just a little bit less than that and then I'll check the uh, oil level and go from there. So uh, the oil I'll be using today is this stuff here. It's called a Valvoline Premium Blue. It's a diesel engine oil. And I'm using the uh, 10W30 weight oil, uh, which is a lighter oil. You can go up to 15W40 on this engine. But uh, I decided to use the lighter oil weight because I run the tractor a lot in the winter time and uh, it makes starting a bit easier because the oil is thinner. Now, uh, this is the only vehicle on my whole property that I'm not using uh, full synthetic oil. This is a semi-synthetic. And uh, that's because I just couldn't find any full synthetic without uh, ordering it online and, and it was very cost prohibitive. So um, I decided to go with this and uh, I've been using this since the uh, tractor was new and so far it's been working out pretty well. Okay, so the oil fill cap is just right here on the top center of the engine. Very easy to access. I've already gone ahead and cleaned off this area so I don't get gunk down into the uh, engine there. And I've cleaned off the oil cap as well. And it looks like the um, little O-ring is still in really good shape. Okay, so we're just below the full mark. Okay, so next up I'll be changing out the uh, hydrostatic transmission filter. Now at the 200 hour mark, there's no requirement to change out the transmission fluid. But if you did want to do that, it's a pretty straightforward process. There's a, a drain plug on the bottom right hand side of the transmission here. And then uh, along the side of the transmission on the opposite side of the tractor, there's a metal strainer. So that has to be taken out and cleaned and replaced. And then to fill up the transmission, you just uh, use the uh, fill tube here underneath the dipstick. Now I highly recommend that you take note of the type of uh, transmission fluid that your BX model requires as it's listed in the operator's manual. And that's because Kubota has a couple of different uh, fluids out there. The newer BX models require a Super UDT2 fluid, which is a fully synthetic fluid. Now uh, Kubota BX owners have uh, complained that they've had overheating transmission issues using uh, other types of fluids, so uh, that's why I mention it, and not all dealers seem to be aware of this. Now, I'll be combining the replacement of the transmission filter with another service item, and that's the adjustment of the HST spring. So that spring is attached to the uh, speed control pedal, so that uh, when you depress the pedal, that's the spring that actually pulls it back to the neutral position. Now, uh, mine's been sticking a little bit in reverse, not to the point that it's uh, dangerous, but it is a little bit annoying after I uh, depress reverse and let go. It takes a little bit of time for the uh, tractor to actually stop. So I'm going to go ahead and tighten that spring a little bit. And the reason I'm combining it with the uh, filter replacement is that spring is just behind the uh, transmission filter. And once I remove the filter, it'll be easier to access. Okay, so you're looking toward the back of the tractor here. So it's uh, pretty easy to locate the uh, transmission filter. It's this white guy here. So fluid still looks pretty clean, which is a good sign. I'll go ahead and let that drain for a bit, and then I'll see if I can access the uh, HST spring. 
Now here's something interesting. I heard kind of a popping sound when I was taking off the filter. Looks like the uh, O-ring is uh, just about popped off of the filter. So something you always want to check, you want to make sure the O-ring hasn't been uh, left on the uh, transmission or if you're changing engine oil onto the engine, uh, you don't want um, two O-rings whenever you go back and replace the uh, new filter. Okay, I think I could actually access the uh, spring adjustment with the uh, filter in place, but uh, having the filter off will make it a little bit easier. However, I'm not able to uh, reach it with this uh, skid plate in place, so I need to take this off, which is uh, should be easy enough. There's um, two 14 millimeter bolts on either side and it should pop right off. Okay, so looking toward the back of the tractor again, here's where I've removed the uh, transmission filter. And just above that is the cooling fan. And back behind the cooling fan, right here, is the HST spring that we want to add tension to. Now that spring is attached to a uh, bolt and a couple of nuts. And uh, at the bottom, hopefully you can see that down here, right about here. So we have an upper nut and a lower nut. And basically what you want to do is you want to uh, loosen that upper nut. It's a 12 millimeter. You'll need an open end uh, wrench there for, for that top one. And then you want to tighten this bottom one and that will push that bolt downwards and uh, that'll add tension to the spring. Now for the bottom one, I couldn't get it with the wrench. I had to use a ratchet just because of the clearance uh, under here, but um, that seems to be working. So let me go ahead and do that. I can't really film it while I'm uh, doing it. So I'm going to turn off the camera. Okay, so here's what the uh, finished job looks like. I've adjusted that uh, bolt down. And uh, when I started, it was just barely protruding there from that bottom nut. Now you can see there's a, a bit more there and that spring is tight. I've uh, checked the uh, pedal and it definitely has a bit more tension on it. So we're gonna uh, go from there and see how that works out. Okay, so I got the new transmission filter and I put a bit of fluid in it. And again, put a, a bead of uh, fluid around the uh, little O-ring there. So it's ready to go on. Now, uh, by the way, I did jack up the back end here, but I did that mainly to gain clearance to get up to that spring. If you're just uh, replacing the transmission filter, you probably don't need to do that. Okay, so I've changed out the engine oil, engine oil filter, and the uh, transmission filter. So now I'm going to go ahead and start up the tractor and check for leaks. So I'll check for leaks around the engine oil drain plug and around both filters. Now after I've done that, I'll go ahead and shut down the tractor, let it sit for a while, and then I'll uh, check the uh, fluid levels again, and I'll add fluids as necessary. Okay, so even though I added a bit of uh, fluid into the transmission filter before I installed the new one, I ended up losing a little bit more fluid than I uh, added in. So I'm going to go ahead and top it off now. Now, if you're wondering why I have my uh, Super UDT2 fluid in a uh, plastic water container, it's because the last time I bought fluid, I bought it in a five gallon bucket. And uh, when you're just topping it off like this, a big five gallon bucket is a bit too heavy to be lugging around. Okay, so next I want to check out the fan belt tension. So uh, the user's manual actually provides a specification for the allowed deflection of the fan belt if you push it with your finger between the two pulleys. So uh, the manual states that it should deflect between 7 and 9 millimeters. So I went ahead and got my calipers out here and uh, let's see how much deflection I have. Okay, so here's the fan belt right here. This is the uh, alternator on the uh, right side of the engine. So I've gone ahead and adjusted my calipers out to where I think we are in terms of deflection. So I'm just going to push on this. Yeah, it's roughly there. So this is about how much deflection I'm getting. So while I'm way off, so I'm measuring uh, 33 millimeters of deflection and the manual says that it should be seven to nine millimeters. So uh, that definitely needs to be adjusted. That belt is loose. Okay, so in order to um, tighten up the uh, fan belt here, I need to rotate the alternator out this way. So there are two bolts holding it in. There's one on the top here on the bracket. And there's a second one down here on the bottom. Now the bottom one actually has a couple of nuts on the end. So there's one way out here on this end here, and there's a, a nut here in the middle, which uh, will have to be accessed with a uh, open end wrench. And then the uh, bolt is uh, on this end. So everything is 12 millimeters. So everything can be loosened up 
with a single wrench. So I've gone ahead and loosened everything so I should be able to rotate the alternator out now to tighten up the belt. Yeah, and so um, since I had a lot of deflection, I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, rotate it all the way out. Now there's a little zip tie here in the way which prevents me from coming out any further. So I'm just gonna stop there and take a measurement and see if I need to remove that zip tie or not. So I'm just gonna tighten the top one for now and we'll see how much deflection I have there. And then uh, I'll go from there and adjust accordingly. So I have uh, my calipers out. I've got them set to eight millimeters which is uh, right between the minimum and maximum seven to nine millimeter spec in the manual. So I'm just gonna put these down in here and then uh, push on the uh, belt there, try to measure the deflection I have. Okay, so it's a little hard to see in there, but I'm pretty much right on the money, I would say. So it's deflecting about eight millimeters with uh, uh, this position here. So. I think we're going to call this done. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, tighten up the uh, the bolt down here and uh, we'll go from there. Now this belt's getting a little tattered so I may need to uh, replace that pretty soon. So something to uh, keep an eye on. Now the 200 hour mark, I don't need to change out the fuel filters but I do need to inspect them as well as the uh, fuel lines. So I have uh, hard fuel lines up here on the left side of the engine and uh, you can see these are all uh, nice and dry, no issues there. And uh, on the left side here is also the uh, first fuel filter if I turn on this uh, bright light here, I can actually see straight through the filter and I can see there are no obstructions. Of course, the engine's been running good, so I wouldn't think that there would be, but uh, I can also inspect the uh, rubber hose here and everything looks good. I, mean, I don't see any cracks or any uh, leaks. So uh, the first one checks out, the second uh, fuel filter is underneath, so uh, let me go under there and check out that one as well. Okay, so I'm under the tractor. Here's the uh, transmission cooling fan straight back there. And right here is the uh, second fuel filter. And again, I have the uh, bright light on. Everything looks good in there. I don't see any uh, cracks in the filter or in the hose. And I don't see any leaks or drips or anything like that. So I think uh, we're in good shape in terms of the fuel filters. Okay, so next I'll be checking out the hydraulic lines and hoses. Now here's where the uh, hydraulics attach to the front end loader. And I'm just doing a visual inspection here to make sure there's no visible damage or any leaks. Now uh, when you disconnect the hoses here, you will get a little bit of dripping and of course that's normal. You don't want to mistake that for an active leak. But uh, other than that, I don't see any uh, leaks here. I've checked the underside here and I followed these uh, hard lines into the center of the tractor and I can't see any leaks there as well. So I think these hard lines are okay. Now there are some uh, hoses on the uh, front end loader and I'll do a visual inspection on those next. Okay, so I've inspected the uh, hoses here on the front end loader on both ends and everything looks to be in good shape. I don't see any cracks or any leaks or anything of that sort. So uh, I will take this opportunity to go ahead and clean off all the connection points, both here on the uh, front end loader as well as on the tractor. And over here on the left side of the tractor, you have uh, four hydraulic hoses as well and you want to check those for leaks. Now uh, they connect up here just underneath the uh, steering wheel. And uh, these two here actually run down to the front of the uh, tractor for the uh, hydraulic steering. So uh, we'll get to that next, but uh, right now I don't see any leaks under here or any cracks in the hoses. Okay, so I'm uh, here at the front of the tractor, and just under here is the uh, steering cylinder. And these are the uh, connection points here for the uh, other end of those uh, hydraulic hoses for the uh, steering. And I don't see any problems down here. I don't see any uh, leaks or any cracked hoses or anything along those lines. So I think we're in good shape there. Okay, so I'm in the process of checking out all the hoses. Now I've already checked out this uh, air intake hose and I've checked out all the hydraulic hoses. Now uh, under the hood here is the upper radiator hose here and down here is the lower radiator hose. And I have a couple of uh, hoses here for the uh, coolant overflow bottle. Now everything's checking out pretty good and I don't see any leaks or any cracks in the hoses. So I think our uh, hose checkout is done. Okay, so next up I'll be uh, cleaning out the radiator screen. So uh, there's just a little tab here just behind the radiator. You just pull it straight up. You have this screen here, it has a bit of uh, bugs and debris in there. I'm just going to blow it out with the um, air compressor and put it back in the same way I took it out. Well, while I'm at it, I have some uh, bugs down here in the radiator too, so I'm going to go ahead and blow those out as well. I also want to check out this uh, panel here and make sure it doesn't have any uh, dirt and debris in it. Now I can see right through mine and it uh, looks perfectly clean. Now if you do need to uh, clean this, you just unscrew this knob here and it just pulls straight out. And uh, you can blow it out with air or wash it off with a water hose. Okay, so now it's time to check out the brake pedal travel. So according to the manual, I should have between 1 and 1.4 inches of travel here on the brake pedal. Now if I measure 
from uh, this point here, I'm right about uh, eight inches. And if I fully depress the pedal, I am uh, roughly at six inches. So that's two inches of travel, which is too much. So I'm gonna go ahead and adjust this down. Okay, so I removed the uh, right rear tractor tire in order to get to the adjustment for the brake pedal travel. So there's a, a turnbuckle right here. You can see there's a little uh, jam nut here. So I've loosened that jam nut. And according to the manual, what I need to do is uh, adjust the turnbuckle here until I have a 0.4 inches or 10 millimeters of travel on the uh, brake pedal. And once I've done that, then I back off the uh, turnbuckle one full turn and that should put me where I need to be. So uh, that's what I'm doing now. Uh, both the nut and the turnbuckle are uh, 14 millimeters. So I'm just backing off this nut here. And uh, to reduce the slack, I'm just adjusting this turnbuckle downward like this. And I'll give it a few turns and I'll check the uh, brake pedal play and uh, continue the process until I get about 0.4 inches of travel. Okay, so I'm measuring at about 0.4 inches of uh, travel in the brake pedal. So I'm going to go ahead and mark my turnbuckle here. I'm going to back it off by uh, one full turn, which means I need to come back in the up direction. Well, I see my mark again, and there it is. Okay, so now I just need to tighten that jam nut back. Okay, so this job is done. Okay, so next I'm going to uh, determine how much toe in I have here on the uh, front wheels. Now, according to the manual, you want to take two measurements. You want to measure the distance between the uh, rear of the front wheels and the front of the front wheels. And the uh, measurement in the front of the front wheels should be between zero and 0.2 inches or zero and five millimeters less than the uh, distance between the uh, rear side of the front wheels. Now I've already measured the uh, rear side of the front wheels. I'm gonna go ahead and measure the front. Now according to the manual, you wanna measure right at the tire bead at the hub level. Now uh, my rear measurement here was 29 and a quarter inches. So let me see what I have in the front. I have exactly 29 and a quarter inches here in the front, which means I have uh, basically zero toe in, which is acceptable in the manual. So I'm not gonna be adjusting these at all. I think we're uh, good here. But if you do need to adjust your toe in, it's a pretty simple process. You just have a, a jam nut here and a turnbuckle here. So you just loosen that jam nut and turn your turnbuckle in uh, whichever way you need to go in order to meet the spec and then tighten that jam nut back up and away you go. Okay, so next I'll be making sure all the wheel bolts are torqued down properly. Now the uh, front here requires 110 foot-pounds. So I have my uh, torque wrench here set to 110 and a, a 19 millimeter socket. Now when you uh, tighten these down, you wanna use a, a crisscross pattern. And for the rear wheels, I have a, a 21 millimeter socket and it's set for uh, 88 foot-pounds. Okay, so next I'll be checking tire pressure. Now since tire pressure is something I deal with pretty frequently, I put labels right here on the tractor to tell me how much pressure I should have in the front and rear tires. That just uh, saves me a little bit of time so I don't have to go find the manual every time. Now according to this, I need uh, 17 PSI in the front tires and uh, 14 PSI in the rear. Okay, so that's it. The 200 hour service is officially done. I just need to get my front end loader connected back up and I'll take the tractor outside. So uh, thanks for hanging in there. Hopefully this was informative and uh, we'll see you next time.